Well, welcome everyone. I'm Amy McKinney. I teach history at Northwest College. And I was really excited when Amy contacted me about this project. I mean, first of all, because she has a beautiful name. Um, but also I thought it was a really exciting project. I mean, and I do really think she deserves some, she's walking away. But Amy definitely spearheaded the, the writing of the grant. Um, the whole process of putting together the summer series. So I I really want to call attention to all the work that she did. And it's bittersweet because today is her last day here at the museum. She will be leaving to go to Cody to work at the Drake Museum. So if you could just spend a few moments giving her a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, this this really was her her brainchild. So um, so when she approached me about it, you know, we talked about doing the the oral histories and kind of having this last talk be kind of looking at the oral histories as a whole and be able to look at some of the major themes and issues that the the people bring up in their oral histories. So this isn't going to be a, a real detailed ranch by ranch history. It's more looking at the overall transformation of, of the ranching industry in the TC. And again, some of the major themes that the, the ranchers talk about in the oral history. So I, I did want to start with just some general information about the um, cattle frontier in general and how Wyoming and the TC fit into that. So if we look at the progression of, of ranching in Wyoming, a lot of it begins with obviously a demand for, for cattle. And it's with the uh, Overland Trail where we have, you know, 350,000 people pass through what becomes Wyoming between 1841 and 1860, either on their way to Oregon or to Utah or to California. So at major forts along the way, there definitely were a lot, a lot of demand for food and supplies. So we see kind of the earliest really small herds around some of those forts during that immigrant period. Where we start to see an increased demand for cattle is after the Civil War, or the Civil War era. So we got a lot of different things happening nationally at that time. You know, one is, is mechanization and the, and the Industrial Revolution. So we see more meatpacking industry, especially in the East. Um, we see transcontinental railroad being built, refrigerated cars becoming more common. Um, so it's both easier to transport that, that cattle and to be able to have a market for it, especially in the East where we see uh, a pretty significant population increase. You know, from the end of the Civil War to 1900, the U.S. population roughly doubles. So, I mean, there's definitely a, a greater demand. Um, but we also see if we look at Wyoming specifically, I mean, we have the, the Transcontinental Railroad going through that southern part of Wyoming. But we also have that intersected in, in Cheyenne with a pretty major cattle drive trail. Because the other thing that's happening in that kind of Civil War era is that there was a, actually a decrease in interest in, in cattle in Texas. So there's about 5 million Texas Longhorn cattle that are basically abandoned. And if you wanted to go to Texas and round them up and drive them north to the open range, then that is how many of cattlemen got their start in that 1860 period. Um, Wyoming and Montana in particular were ideal because the, the bison population by that point had pretty much been hunted out or was on the verge of that. Um, so there were natural grasslands that were very uh, suitable for cattle grazing. So with not a lot of population base in what becomes Wyoming and Montana, it becomes kind of my ideal location. So between about 1867 and 1887 is where we see kind of that boom period. And really it's the 1870s to the 1880s where it's the peak of that boom. And Wyoming and the Titsi definitely is wrapped up in that. So if we look at kind of the, again, kind of the, the reasons of that, it has a lot to do with more outside um, reasons than we see as actually demand of people 
living in Wyoming. We'll get there, but at, at that early point, uh, it's it's a lot of you know meeting demands in the east. So with the open cattle range, uh, obviously there's going to be a huge growth in the number of cattle in what becomes Wyoming. Uh, at its peak, there probably was about a, a million and a half cattle at that time period, which is about what we have now. So today, I mean, it's kind of reaches, but in a short amount of time, we're going from about 18, 18, what was it, 1870, there was 8,000 cattle, and then 1886, 1 1.5 million. Oh, no. <laughs> so amount of time. We also see that there are over 200 cattle ranches in Wyoming during that period. About half of them are out of state companies or even foreign. There are about a dozen cattle companies in Wyoming that headquartered in, in Europe, specifically uh, England is where most of them were from. So about half were not centered in Wyoming. And uh, you know, again, going back to look at the overall history of Wyoming, kind of this boom and bust cycle, you know exploitation of natural resource, you have the money leaving the area, and then that, that bust. So a lot of the money for the cattle industry, at least in that, that 1870, 1887 period, was really, most of it was leaving the territory. Um, but we do see a lot of significant cattle companies that are from Wyoming that are developing around that time. So in this area, I mean, everybody knows about Pitchfork Ranch. I mean, that was one of the earliest ranches in this area that brought cattle to, to the Matisse area. So 1872. So right in this peak period of, of the cattle industry. Um, Frank Otto, oh, oh Frank, <laughs> backwards. Um, it was the, the founder of the Pitchfork Ranch. And again, really opened up this area for the cattle industry. Because again, you have the natural resources to be able to, to feed the cattle, to graze the cattle. So at this time with open range, there's no hay. There is no winter feed that the farmers are, or the ranchers are producing. They are relying almost exclusively on being able to graze the cattle in the open range. So we talk about a boom and bust cycle. So what brings about the bust? That's the winter of 1886, 87. So this was a particularly brutal winter so we got a couple of things going on. There was that summer before we start to see kind of the beginnings of a drought. So there already was some pressure being put on the pasture land. We also see by that point, a lot of overgrazing. So what grasslands were still there, there was a lot of pressure already placed on it. So it wasn't great grass to begin with going into the winter. So we have an early freeze that's that, that's followed by a Chinook. So it all melts and then winter sets in. And it creates a really hard crust over that grassland that cattle can't get to. We are seeing temperatures, I think um, Miles City, Montana is one of the coldest reported about 60 below that it got to. And, and this is not just for a few days. I mean, this is from, you know, about, early December to early March, where there were these sub-zero temperatures and blizz, I mean, just a miserable winter. For many of the cattle, they were already out on their winter pasture. So a lot of the ranch hands and, and cowboys couldn't even get to them. So they basically had to ride out the winter. And when the winter ended and we start to see the thaw of, of spring, cattlemen are discovering that they had heavy, heavy losses with their cattle. Now there's been a lot of reports of really big losses. Um, people today think that there probably was some exaggeration. I mean, there's some cattlemen reporting anywhere from 50 to 90% losses. That probably is a pretty severe exaggeration. More so what we see is somewhere around 15 to 20%, which still is very significant. But these are significant losses. And if you have, a number of companies within the <clears throat> within the territory that aren't even here. A lot of those big cattle companies from, from back east cut their losses. You know, the international companies cut their losses. And we see a really significant change to how cattle are run in Wyoming. So first of all, we're going to see the, the removal of a lot of those big out-of-state companies. We're also going to see smaller firms. 
you know, some of these cattle companies during that boom period had herds into the tens of thousands. Uh, it's really difficult to care for that number, especially if what other what also happens as a result of this freeze out, they realize that they can't just depend on the open range for food. And they have to start haying, they have to start producing food to feed the cattle during the, especially during the winter months. I mean, you see some um, throughout the year, but especially during the winter, we're gonna have to put up hay for that. I mean, you can't put up hay for that number of cattle. It's too labor intensive, it's too expensive. So the size of herds begin to decline. Um, the other thing that we see is a focus on diversification. I mean, because a lot of these cattle companies, that's all they were doing was cattle. And if you have heavy losses on one thing on your ranch, then that has a pretty severe consequence for your body. So diversification could be a lot of them also begin raising sheep, uh, which we'll talk about here in a bit. But we also see, you know, some raising grain. Um, they are doing other things besides cattle. They understand that diversification is going to be really important. We also see as a result of that diet that there's going to be a need to be able to create some outbuildings. You know, that there has to be some shelter areas. Um, but one of the big things is how are we going to manage grazing? Grazing is still going to be important. You can't just you can't feed them hay all the time. There has to still be pasture, there still has to be grazing. But how are they going to be able to? better manage that grazing. So overgrazing becomes a, a really big concern. So we see that transformation uh, in the Titi. You know, a lot of that, we see the, the after effects of the winter. A lot of the main ranches or big ranches in the Titi develop after this big die-out. So we see, at least for the oral histories that I looked at, um, the pitchfork was the only one in operation during that winter. Many of the other ones begin in um, 1890s or the first decade of the 1900s. So they are doing and, and um, understanding the need for transformation. And so they have already kind of adapted to those major changes that come as a result of the, of the big die out. Because obviously cattle is still really important to not just Wyoming, but Matitsi. So what we see then are these small, kind of goes back more to those um, family operated ranches, which had been in Wyoming prior to the, the boom period um, of the 1870s and 1880s. So more family ran organizations. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. So this is George Florida's place. Oh, okay. Um, George, Florida, uh, his mother actually homesteaded in Goose, Goose Creek uh, area, Goose, Goose Barrier Creek area. Um, so this picture was taken in 1923, January of 1922. There's reports in the newspaper that he's helping build a home for his mom's homestead. Um, she proves up five years later, he needs the five years. Unfortunately, she dies three months after she proves up. <laughs> she didn't get to keep that homestead very long. But we see these family ran ranches become a much more mainstay of, of um, Wyoming ranches. So one of the things that they do to adapt to graze land, um, this comes later, but we see different ways to try to, especially like the Taylor Grazing Act of, of 1934, where the government is setting up districts, grazing district. What we see more today are ranchers who um, get grazing permits through the federal government, whether that be through the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service. Um, but the, the government has set up some pretty strict regulations to try to make sure that the grazing land is protected and can be used by you know, more ranchers and be able to use it in years to come. So getting those graze permits is pretty important. And, and ranchers who abuse that grazing land who are not using it according to how the government has set up the guidelines can lose their permits and that's a really big deal. Um, but that is definitely one major outcome, I mean, present day that's, that stems from the aftermath of that, that um, open frontier, open range. So in looking at some of the themes that come out of the oral history, obviously branding 
is a big part of that. I mean, that's a major um, job on the ranch is to be able to brand and keep track of, of the cattle. Branding has a very long history, and that is something that is in the booklet, that the article that Amy wrote. Um, this goes back to ancient Egypt. I mean, so this isn't anything new. Uh, there's different types of branding. Um, hot branding is what most know in this area. Uh, but being able to come up with those brands becomes really important. It becomes overseen by the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. They have a brand book. I mean, you have some of the larger ranches that have dozens of unique brands. And it was the job of the, of the cowboys and the brand inspectors to be able to know whose brand went with what ranch. And that was a major undertaking. I mean, these brand books are so huge if you've gone through them. Um, so branding is you know, a, a very important aspect and not just for the, the finances of the ranch, not just for being able to keep track of your cattle and understand who's what. I mean, that certainly is a big part of it. But the other aspect is the social, social aspect of the brand. Uh, a lot of people talked about in their in their oral histories that the, the brands were a time to be able to unite with, with the other people in the area. You brought, you brought in branding crews. There usually were uh, a lot of really fun meals. Uh, women, definitely, one of the big jobs that they had was to cook for the branding crews. Who had the best pies and who had the better meals. Uh, so, I mean, these really were things that were hard work. I mean, it takes a lot of skill to be able to do these brands, but that community spirit of them is something that a lot of the people talked about in their oral histories, that this was a way for the community to come together uh, and, and um, have that spirit, have that connection. Another way that we see kind of the... Um, the ranches of, of Natitsi gaining more and more uh, reputation comes through the photography of Charter Belden, who, I mean, this is probably one of his most commercialized photographs um, used in some advertisements, but he really was one who, who wanted to capture the spirit of ranching and the spirit of the West in general, but um, he's focusing on the Pitchfork Ranch. And I think he does a really nice job showing kind of the, the challenges and why people were willing to put up with these challenges. So, you know, it's not great pay, it's long hours, it's hard physical work. So why do they do it? And I think this photograph in a lot of ways encapsulates that. You know, it's, it's the connection with the animals, the, the, the love of the outdoors, um, that uh, ability to have kind of more um, independence in your work day. I mean, you kind of are out there and, um, you know, sometimes on days on end, you don't have a, a boss right on you. Um, but that, that adventure, that connection, that outdoorsness, um, and that caring for the animal, I think is a, a big part. Because <laughs> again, you know, these um, moving cattle, moving them to different pastures, moving them for branding, um, you know, you have to deal with the weather, long days in the saddle. So I think um, his ability to be able to capture that, I think his, his photographs are, are really, really important. So another thing that a lot of people talked about in the oral histories was the need to start growing hay and putting up hay. So part of it is, is talking about just the the need for it and a, and a recognition that they have to do this. This now is commonplace for ranching. You cannot have a cattle or a sheep ranch and not produce some winter feed. So if you're gonna go into ranching, you have to understand that this is a part of it. And the, the open range, you know, just depending on natural grasslands is not gonna make you get through it anymore. The technology of it, however, I think is really interesting as well. So in the early days of hay, there's not a lot of, of equipment. So a lot of it was done by hand with horsepower. Um, the haystacks look very different than, than they do now. So you have kind of those big loose um, bundles of hay that you would have to use a pitchfork and, and, and take to the, to the cattle. You do start to see some, some uh, equipment being used like these slides that could, that could pitch the, the hay. 
Uh, one of the oral histories I thought was a funny story. He's talking about his dad was up on, on horseback and kind of could oversee the, the meadow and saw the, the haystack. And again, one of these loose haystacks. And he kept looking at it and he saw, he's like, is that moving? And he kind of looked at it again. And you could see that this, there's movement in this haystack. And upon further investigation, there was a woman in the area who was notorious for basically stealing hay from area ranchers. <laughs> she didn't want to grow her own hay. And she was going in and bundling up portions of these loosely uh, the hay and taking them to feed her goats. Uh, so. <laughs> well, we have a video of that, uh, of that oral history and then we have photos and um, we'll go your red, of course. <laughs> there's certificates. Um, and we'll have videos that are released on YouTube. Yeah. Um, that, that was a great story. As time goes on and, and hay becomes, like I said, it's a main mainstay of, of ranching now, the equipment gets better. And with that, you can get better stacked hay. And there's a lot of pride in, in the oral histories of people talking about their hay stacks. You know, the, the tightness of them, the symmetry of them, how well they were stacked. Uh, first of all, because job well done, pride and pride and work, uh, but also the importance of having properly bailed hay. You know, the tightness, so you know, if it if it gets moist, it's not gonna it's not gonna ruin the hay. It will help uh, keep out a lot of that moisture, especially if it rains. Um, it helps maintain. Um, you know, again, so it just it stays fresh or not. So there's many times in the oral histories where they are they are basically, you know, job well done on the on the haystacking. Um, being able to drive by a, a ranch and say, no, that that's a Webster haystack. Mm -hmm. You know, that we we can tell based on what we see is important and and the quality of the of the haystack. You know, that's something to be proud of. Obviously, the equipment is going to, to help with that. Um, the other thing that comes out of it is, again, this is pretty labor intensive, especially in the beginning, where haying could take several weeks and it would require a haying group where you would have to hire anywhere from 12 to 15 people to come to your ranch and help with, with hay, uh, with the cutting, with the stacking, with the baling, all of that. But with better equipment, especially once they get the swathers and the and the automatic balers, now you can have one or two people who can do the hay in a matter of days. So on one hand, it's seen as great because it's less demanding work. And fewer people can do it. You can do it in a short, shorter amount of time. But the other thing that they are talking about is, you know, yes, mechanization was great, and mechanization does help bigger ranches, you know, all of that were seen in, in positive light. But there also is a downside to that. You know, fewer people working on the ranch and, and the what they see as potential concerns about the future of ranching, if you have fewer people doing it um, and not being able to have as many family members who might want to stay on the ranch. You know, they don't have enough work for them. Um, so that's kind of, in some ways, bittersweet. Um, but I, I really like this photograph too. You can't, it's hard to tell uh, unless you get really close to the photograph, but they are actually using a tape measure to measure the height of the hay. Uh, I think this is from the 1960s. Obviously, mechanization, one of the things that becomes again commonplace are, are tractors. You know, initially, some of the early tractors don't have a whole lot of horsepower or motor power. Um, so they adapt a lot of machinery that they had been using with horses and then just pick a, pitch them up to the tractor and use the same equipment, the same plows, you know, all the things that they had used with the horses, they are now using with their tractors. Uh, equipment's expensive. This was a big transformation. Uh, it was a big commitment to take on the expense of, of buying this equipment. A lot of ranches went into debt in order to do it. Um, so you use what you have until you could maybe afford to get something that was newer, bigger, better. Um, but a lot of ranchers talked about kind of making do with some of those earlier tractors and, and using them for decades. 
you know, there was one that talked about that they used the same tractor on their ranch for over 30 years. You know, that, yes, it was slower. Yes, it might take longer to do things, but it ran and it works. We're going to continue to use it. You know, that was, you know, an attitude of a, of a lot of the ranchers that um, you, you don't just buy bigger because it's there. You know, if it's if it's going to be something that is useful, if it's going to be something that's needed, that's one thing. Um, but a lot of ranches didn't have the luxury of just buying the newest thing that was out because it was the newest thing. Um, but being able to to use the tractors, the combines, the threshing machine, all of that really revolutionizes not just ranching but farming. Um, and again, like I said, you kind of have that double edge. On, on, it doesn't require as many bodies. It doesn't require as many people to do the same work. And you now can increase your acreage. So we start to see the size of ranches increase and the number of ranches decrease. So a lot of these ranches are buying up parcels from, from smaller ranches in the area. Another really important aspect of, of ranching in the Matitsi area was uh, sheep herding, sheep ranching. So many of these, these ranches will end up having both cattle and sheep, um, but you do have some that are either, either or. This was not something that cattlemen were initially excited about. Uh, there was a lot of conflict between the cattlemen and the sheep herders initially. Uh, violence was pretty common. Uh, throughout the state, there were around I think I found about 15 to 16 documented cases of where sheep herds were attacked by local ranchers who did not want sheep in their area. Now, a lot of it was conflict over pasture land and grazing land. Uh, they didn't like how the, the sheep, how the hooves of the sheep kind of cut up the grass and cat cattle didn't really like the sheep there. And, and, and it, there was concern about what it would do to the quality of the, of the grassland. So, I mean, there definitely was conflict there, um, but to the degree of, of attacking sheep herds, it got, it got pretty bad. Uh, and from the late 1890s, from about 1896 to 1909, like I said, there were about 15 reported cases of sheep herds being attacked. Not, I didn't find any in uh, the direct Matisse area. Uh, the two closest, there's one in Bighorn County where a sheep herd, um, the report said that there were sheep that were killed by um, either being clubbed to death or dynamited. I mean, that was the only case that I saw that said that they were dynamited. A lot reported about them being clubbed to death or um, shot or throat slit. Um, but it was, I mean, we're talking thousands of sheep that were killed in the process. So the, the one that was in Bighorn County was in 1905. The, the peak of these attacks came in 1909 in Spring Creek. Uh, and here we see not only sheep, and, and the sheep dogs were killed too in a lot of these cases. Um, but the one in 1909 in Spring Creek is where we actually see three sheep herders who were killed. So that's kind of the, the pinnacle. That case, the, the, the attackers did leave behind some evidence, so they were actually able to find them and arrest them. Uh, but many of these other cases never were able to figure out who did it. I mean, they had suspects. They had people that they suspected had carried it out. But as far as being able to have hard, clear evidence, it's not until that 1909 case that we see some, some clear um, ability to make arrests and prosecute people for it. Part of the reason, you know, like I said, was conflict over rangeland, over, over grazing land. But we also see that the cattle industry in that first decade of the 1900s is beginning to decline. Prices are going down. Where sheep prices, wool prices in particular, are going up. So the value of production at this time, as we look at sheep, um, the value of Wyoming sheep in 1909 was 32.1 million and cattle was at 26.2 million. Mm -hmm. So there had been kind of a, you know, sheep overshadowed cattle at that time. That same year, 1909, Wyoming had 7.3 million sheep, but just under a million cattle, 960,000. 
So for many of these cattlemen, not just in the Matisse area, but around Wyoming, are again, going back to that need to diversify. So we see a lot of these ranches then who are now have both cattle and sheep. Um, being able to have sheep definitely provided not just another revenue stream of having two different animals, but with sheep, you have the ability to have the wool. And then also if you wanted to sell for mutton or, or even um, stud beef if you had rams. This one's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but being able to see the sheep along uh, the ranch of the Matisse definitely become common. Up until about the 1970s, we start to see a decline in sheep prices. Uh, a lot of that because there's less demand for wool. We have more synthetic um, fabrics that are, are cheaper and more in demand. Um, but you know, in this early 1900s, even into the 1920s and 30s, there was a lot of demand. Wool in particular in the 19-teens, World War I, demands for uniforms. I mean, so you, you have a lot of, of that uh, economic demand. This photograph I think is really interesting because it shows you know, how much wool you can get just from, from one sheep. So, um, but that sheep industry definitely is another important aspect of it. With that, I mean, again, the, the sheep wagon becomes a, a common, uh, common thing that you see throughout the, the sheep industry. But we also then see uh, a lot of women who were participated in both the sheep and the cattle industry. Um, women either typically, or met most of the time, wives of the, of the cattlemen or sheepmen um, did a lot of the cooking, like I said, for the big times that there was for shearing and for um, uh, ramping. But they also would be out there with the sheep wagons as well. So a lot of that cooking we've seen by, by the women and participating in a lot of the work. I think that's one thing that really gets understated is how much work wives were doing on these ranches. Uh, oftentimes overlooked, uh, but they were out there doing just as much if, uh, work and then having to go in the house and do all the domestic work on top of that. So, which brings me to, you know, talk a little bit about uh, George Florida and his mom, but there were a number of women who homesteaded around Gooseberry Creek, and, and I wrote a short article in the uh, in the booklet about this as well. Um, Amy did a really great blog for the museum that talks about Sylvia Mickelson in particular. Um, she was a businesswoman in in Matitsi. She she ran a store, a dry goods store, a mercantile store. Um, she divorced her husband, and shortly after her divorce she filed for a homestead. So if we look at the 1862 Homestead Act, um, there were th certain things that you, requirements that you had to meet. So first of all, you had to pay your $15 filing fee to be able to get your, your homestead. You had to live there for five years, not continuously. They gave you, you know, six months out of the year, you had to be on the homestead. So you had to have a home, you had to build a home. Uh, you had to cultivate a certain number of acres. I think it was around 80 acres at least had to be cultivated. You had to be a U.S. citizen or have the intent to become a citizen. A lot of people who homesteaded were not U.S. citizens when they put when they uh, got their claim. You had to be working for citizenship if you wanted your your if you wanted to prove up. Um, but you could claim a homestead even if you weren't a citizen but showing that you were intending to become one. For women, the thing that was important is that it said you had to be 21 and head of household. The US government was very intentional in how it wrote that. Head of household meant if you were married, it was the man, the male. But if you were a woman and you were single, either never married, widowed, divorced, or legally separated or deserted, you were considered head of household. The goal of the government with the Homestead Act, and again, this coincides with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The Republican Party in power in 1862 passed the Pacific Railway Act and the Homestead Act both in 1862. That's by no coincidence. 
they wanted people to settle the West. And they saw women as instrumental in doing that. So the ability for women to be able to get a homestead in their own name was considered important. As an aside, Canada had a similar act, the 1872 Land Dominion Land Act. Everything was identical as far as requirements, except for women. The Dominion Land Act stated that you had to be head of household and have to, if you're a woman, head of household and have dependent children. So the only way for a woman in Canada to be able to get a homestead is if she was single and had dependent children. So children under the age of 18. So they're mainly focusing on widows. An unmarried woman with a dependent child probably is not gonna get a homestead. So widowed women in particular, that's because Canada had a different focus on the on the homestead. It's the land Dominion Land Act. Their focus, their goal was on the cultivation of the land. And they did not see women as farmers. So they did not want a lot of women to have homesteads. So many women from Canada came to the United States to homestead. Um, so I think that's a, a really important thing to point out that the US government intentionally wrote that law where women could be eligible for homesteads. Married women, no, because you could not have more than one homestead claim at a time for a household. So if you were married, the husband is head of household. Um, so for these women, they have the opportunity to be able to, to put up these homesteads in, in the Gooseberry Creek area. So Mickelson, as a divorced woman, was able to do that. Uh, she proved up um, she doesn't live much beyond after she, I think she lived about three years after she proved up to when she died. Um, kind of complications from a gallbladder surgery. But the, the museum has some really great photographs of her on, on her homestead. But there were there was plenty of other women who did. One story that I think is really interesting is there was a mother and daughter who homesteaded uh, in Gooseberry Creek area. Uh, the mother uh, was Price, what was the first name? Barbara Price, and the daughter was um, Gracie Steele. So interesting distinctions here. Barbara Price, as a widow, was able to use the Homestead Act. Her daughter, however, was married, but they still wanted to homestead out in this area. So there was a previous law in 1820, the Cash Land Act, where you could purchase the land for $1.25 an acre. So they got adjoining claims. Um, her, Gracie's father-in-law also got a claim in that same area. That was one thing that was really common with homesteading. You know, people have this idea of homesteading that is single people on their own or with their nuclear family that goes out on their own and, and homesteads. Most homesteaders did it in groups. I mean, it was very common for families, especially if they had adult children, where the parents could get a homestead and every adult child could get adjoining claims, and then they could use that land collectively, use it together. So it was not uncommon to, to see that happen. So they proved up on the same day, which I thought was really cool, the exact same day. Um, they also died a, a year apart. Uh, the the articles didn't give reasons for death, especially for Gracie, um, but you know they they were able to kind of do that homestead together and and unfortunately died within a year of one another. Now, one that I was hoping to find more information on, and Alex did a lot of research on this as well, is the notorious Matilda Dean. Uh, she was married to the you know famous. Mayor of Matitsi starts the uh, Labor Day barbecue. Um, they, at best, I think, had a tenuous marriage. Uh, she had been married before. Her daughter from the previous marriage, I mean, you see in the census records that the daughter-in-law is, is living with them. But in 1911, there is this cryptic newspaper article that says that Matilda was, um, charged with being an accomplice and with attempting to kill her husband with the aid of a ranch hand. That's it. That's the only thing that's in it. 
There is no further record of it. There's nothing in the newspaper. I mean, this is the man becomes a mayor of Matizzi. Nothing is there. There is there's the the book, the charge book, um, and they say and she's she never goes to jail. They said because Park County was newly created, there was kind of like this. Bermuda Triangle almost <laughs> like the legality of it. And so she's never she's never charged. And what I find really interesting is that that's the only notice of it. I mean, there, I mean, there had to have been more public interest in the case. But she wasn't successful. That's true. So yeah. But she did a Alex did a lot of digging, I did digging, and we that's that those are the only things we could find. So, but she she had a homestead. <laughs> she claimed she was able to settle up on her homestead. Um, she actually, like uh, Gracie Steele, had a cash entry. So at the time that she proved up on on her homestead, she was still legally married. Um, so she did the cash entry where she paid a dollar twenty five a paper. Um, but. The, the mystery of the attempted murder is going to bug me because <laughs> to me that is a pretty important story. Um, another thing that kind of has a, a interesting story to it is Sarah Florida. So I showed you the, the picture of her son George's ranch with with the very cute cat. Um, he was the son that was very much interested in ranching, um, and and she was able to get her own homestead nearby. Um, she was a fairly well-known widow in the area. Um, she was referred to as grandma by a lot of people in town. Her other son, however, did not have the same uh, demeanor. Uh, he had a bit more problems. Uh, he didn't He didn't want a ranch. Uh, there's a record of him of, uh, where he had to register for World War I. And he had to, you know, he put his occupation as out of work. He was basically, you know, living off of his mother. Um, but the, just a month after George builds a home for his mother for her homestead, Grover, Grover Cleveland, Florida, named after Grover Cleveland, um, he gets arrested alongside the notorious um, moonshiner in, in the area. Uh, was it something now? Rock, yeah, Rocco now. So he gets arrested with her for moonshining. Um, later on, there's another story where he was arrested for stealing cars. So he definitely had a much more difficult time than, than his brother. Um, his mother had passed away by the time that he was arrested for the for the car car theft. Um, but like I said, she was the oldest. Of the homesteaders that in the in the women that I looked at, she was 72 years old when she applied for her homestead. And you have five years where until you can prove up. Later on, they changed the law to a three-year prove up period. Um, but she she was on the five-year homestead. Um, so like I said, she didn't get to enjoy that homestead for long. But um, I think it's interesting that you know this was a way for. Um, women in particular, especially widows, to be able to have some, some income. And the other thing about homesteading, um, you know, a lot of people think of it as successful homesteaders are those who prove up and then stay on the land. And certainly if we look at histories of homesteading, that, that's what you see for decades. You know, these are successful homesteaders. So a lot of, of women homesteaders are left out of that narrative. It's not until the mid-1970s that we start to see some pretty serious academic work looking and investigating how many women homesteaded. Um, there were about 15 to 20 percent of all homesteaders were women. So it was a pretty substantial number. Um, many women homesteaded not to have a farm or a ranch that they would work, but as an investment property. And that might be what Sylvia Mickelson was doing. You know, there's not a lot of evidence in the, in the newspaper reports. You know, she had her, her store in the Titsi, but it gets kind of hazy on how long she had that store after she, after she got her ranch uh, or homestead. But a lot of people would do that. They would use the, the capital of the land as an investment, either to start a business, if they wanted to buy better land somewhere else, 
Um, but I, I, I suspect, I don't know this for sure, but my suspicion is that in part of what she was doing was trying to, to build, you know, some capital for her, for her store in town. But that's speculation on my part. Um, but those stories then, you know, definitely broaden kind of our understanding of, you know, it's not just huge ranches that are running cattle and sheep. We see some of these larger plots where people are either, you know, have a few cattle, maybe a few sheep, horses, maybe some um, crops that they're growing. But there were a significant number of women in the Matitsi area who had land in their own names. The other thing that we see with, with kind of the scope of ranching uh, late 1800s to present day, uh, we see a continuation of farms being run by families, whether that be single ownership, or sometimes you'll see family partnerships or family corporations. Um, the last census of agriculture that came out in 2017 94% of farms and ranches in Wyoming are family owned. So that, you know, being able to see that being passed down or, or having the next generation buy out the, the farm or ranch is a pretty commonplace. And we see that with a lot of the oral histories. These, these ranches have been in the same family for, for generations. Now, some of these, like the Webster family in particular, ran both cattle and sheep. Uh, the the older brother, the previous generation, um, you see one family who focused on the sheep and the other brother focused on the cow. You see a similar thing in the in the next generation. One family did sheep, one family did um, cattle. So that kind of structure on the ranch <laughs> is still something that is, is very, very prevalent in, in Wyoming today. So um, when we talk about the corporate corporate ranching. Um, I think people get the, the, the idea that these mean huge ranches that have, you know, a, a, a corporation, kind of this faceless corporation that's running it. Most of those are family-run corporations. You know, the only people in the corporation are family members who are running that ranch. Um, so, you know, kind of how you think about corporate ranching. Another development that we see in, in the oral histories is a prevalence of dude ranching in this area. So the Double D definitely is one of the more famous, the Pitchfork Ranch as well had, had dude ranching. Um, but this becomes another way that ranchers are able to um, gain income. You know, this is, if, if you don't want to um, have to rely exclusively on the weather and prices and things that are out of your control when it comes to your bottom line, when it comes to your income. Dude ranching was another popular thing that was happening in the West. Now, part of this is, you know, the result of tourism, you know, that there was demand by people from a, a lot of times the <clears throat> East who wanted that Western experience. Who wanted to be able to work with cat, you know, do a cow drive, you know, do the work of a cowboy. It always makes me think of the movie City Slickers with Billy Crystal. <laughs> I mean, that's what immediately comes to my mind. Um, but this was big business. I mean, this is something that was very popular for the West and it was very profitable. So, the, like I said, the double D, if you want to see the full blowout, you can look behind the screen. We've got that same picture back there. Um, but it, they become popular because they they provided that image of the West that people like, you know, that romanticized view of the West and that ability to get, like I said, that Western experience. And it didn't hurt that you had famous people who were coming to these dude ranches as well. Um, in this area, obviously with the Double D, Amelia Earhart story is well known in this area. Um, but these were things that people gravitated towards. I mean, this, this was family vacations, especially for, um, you know, people coming from areas that otherwise would not have this experience. Um, it become, I mean, anywhere from working the cattle, um, going on trail rides, you know, whatever they wanted to do and didn't always necessarily like the camping. Um, but between this and outfitting, you know, being able to, to guide hunters and anglers is another thing that we see developing more and more 
especially in the Matisse area ranches. Because again, what many of these people are talking about in these oral histories is the struggle, the financial struggle that they have. I mean, there's you know this up and down of the cattle industry and they are having to find other avenues of revenue in order to keep these ranches going. So dude ranching was one way, um, outfitting, especially by like the 1940s, 1950s, it's becoming more popular. Um, more recently, you know, instead of, um, can we have an outfitter? Uh, instead of the idea of a dude ranch, we see kind of this notion of a guest ranch. So being able to rent out your, your ranch with like Airbnb, um, a lot are using like the, the both the homestead and the um, fiddleback ranch, where you can use it for a wedding venue. Um, you can go on horseback riding trail. I mean, they are finding creative ways to be able to use their ranch and and, and keep it going. You know, being able to not have to just solely depend on the the um, cattle market. So uh, Dwayne Hagen was one who, who purchased the Homestead Ranch in uh, 2003, I think is when he purchased it. This cabin was in pretty much disarray, had been kind of abandoned almost. And so he was able, he alongside his wife, were able to redo the, the ranch itself and use it, like I said, for like a guest ranch. The other thing that he does that I think is really interesting is that you know he's a he's an outfitter. He he takes out um, uh, people who want to go trophy hunting, but he also spends a lot of time with the uh, Outdoor Dream Foundation, which is basically like the make make a wish, but for kids who want to go hunting. So he takes a, a couple hunts a year. He'll take out children with severe illnesses and and guide them on on a hunt. Um, he also works with wounded warriors as, a, as, as an outfitter. But a lot of these oral histories talk about at some point, to some degree, that they were either using their ranches as a guest ranch or outfitting. And again, really seeing that as a way to contribute to their overall bottom line. Another common thing that, that people talk about was how they see their place in the ranching industry and it, with the land itself. And many, many of these ranchers talked about the fact that they were stewards of the land, that it's their responsibility to make sure that they take care of the land. If they don't take care of the land, then the land will not take care of their herd. So many of them talked about themselves as, as you know, conservationists that if they don't make sure that they are very particular in how they graze their cattle and sheep, you know, again, if they, uh, if they abuse it, it's not going to sustain them. So, I mean, yes, the BLM and the Forest Service have some restrictions, but they place those on themselves as well. You know, that they understand that conservation and, and seeing themselves as stewards of the land really is an important aspect of what they're doing. So um, Alan and Chris Hogg in particular talked about that they have a, a conservation easement on their ranch through the, the Nature Con uh, Conservancy where they are basically, they cannot break up their ranch. I mean, that's basically what they're trying to do with this, with this organization. They want to minimize development. They want to minimize these large ranches being broken up into smaller parcels. Um, they, it's a way to try to protect the land, protect the resources for not just the cattle, but for other animals in the area as well. Um, so that alongside the Wyoming Stock Growers Land Trust, I mean, that those are things that they are trying to do to help kind of protect, um, protect a lot of the ranches and, and protect kind of that um, ability to, provide for, for the cattle, provide for the for the wildlife in the area. So that is a, was another, I thought, interesting kind of common thread that was throughout a lot of these oral histories. 
So I wanted to end with just thanking the people who were willing to be interviewed. Um, I hope I didn't miss anybody on the list. Uh, but this, I cannot understate, first of all, what a huge undertaking this was by the museum and, and Amy in particular. Oral histories are a lot of work. I mean, not just the fact that you have to find the people to interview, you have to build a trust with them. You have to get them to trust you to tell the, you their story. And that is not always an easy task. Sometimes you have to convince them that their story is worth telling. That can be a, a hurdle a lot of times. Um, but not only then do you have to build that relationship, then you have the, the, the oral history itself, the interview, and then the transcription of it and the ability to make it accessible to the public. So this is a long process. This is a huge amount of oral histories that were done just this summer. So once again, I wanna give a shout out to Amy to overseeing this because I know from someone who has done a lot of oral histories, I know how much work went into this. Um, but I think the, the trust and the passion, that is me, um, was that, I'm sorry. No, because I set a timer, so I knew I wouldn't go over. And I thought, and, and I have 47 seconds left. <laughs> um, but I think it's also really important to acknowledge just how important it is to preserve these histories. You know, a lot of these stories, a lot of, a lot of what they talk about with, the, with their ranching, what they saw as the transformation of, you know, what changes did they did they see in ranching? Uh, and again, that's not just tech, technology just isn't mechanization. I mean, I didn't even go into like the having to switch, I mean, the focus on vaccinations, you know, that that becomes really important. Breeding of cattle, artificial insemination, um, with the, with the hay, a lot of them are having to use irrigation and the, the movement from flood irrigation to sprinkler or, um, irrigation. I mean, there was so much in these oral histories. I was only able to do a small amount. So being able to preserve those oral histories is really invaluable. And I hope that the uh, museum continues to, to do these. Um, I know that the um, ranch tours have been going on for a long time and have been very popular. You know, these are things that matter if we want to preserve this, this part of history, um, not just of Matitsi, but of, of both the cattle and, and sheep industry in Wyoming. So I, I definitely want to give a, a very sincere thanks to those people who spent the time to be interviewed because it's, it's a big commitment. So. So thank you. Does anyone have any, any questions? Any stories of your own? Anyone now want to be interviewed? <laughs> I'm sure Amy will take a list. I guess we're Alex because Amy is in Cleveland. Well, thank you for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. Last time I gave a talk here, I had three people, so. <laughs> Good. Like four to five times more people. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Eventually, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the I don't actually Oh, I'm looking at their boots. Their boots there don't match. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, all I'm asking, yeah. I'm sure it probably just yeah. tells yeah. something, yeah. something different. Yeah. My name is yeah. on that. Was, but okay. you see how sharp those boots are? Yeah.
in there. They're cut back in there. And I've never seen boots like this. Yeah, you have that you mentioned it. I've never looked at that before. Yeah, and I just kind of, I just kind of turned out, right? You know, and I don't, I don't have a good reason for it. But it just of all the things I saw in the slides, which were all wonderful, I saw that quickly. Go back. And yeah. Yeah. Just, I don't know. I, I would love to know what the reason for that is. Yeah. 